Welcome to the Christian Church on a Sunday afternoon, November the 16th, 2014. We just came from a wonderful celebration of my wife and I's 11th anniversary just last evening. And here we are today with a fresh word to preach this everlasting gospel. We started a wonderful series last week entitled True Love. And we began talking about those things that pertain to real love. We learned last week that, you know, part of loving God is keeping his commandments. You understand? Yeah. His commandments, his New Testament, his new covenant because when we say commandments, some people get hung up on the law of Moses. But when we talk about his commandments as it pertained to us Christians, it is that which is contained in the new covenant, in the New Testament, that we are obliged to live by. The old covenant brought death. Because if you didn't keep all 613 commandments, and you got some groups out here that, that try to focus on certain Commandments picked out of those, but the bottom line is if you're under the law of Moses, you had to keep all 613 commands. And if you broke one of them, then a curse came upon you. And if you broke one, it's just like you broke them all. So God gave his son to shed his precious blood to take away our sin that we may be able to live according to the new covenant once we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and acknowledge that God the Father raised him from the dead. We receive eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now we must walk worthy of the vocation of our calling. And we must bear fruit for the kingdom of God. That fruit is the evidence that indeed we yeah. do belong to Christ. It is by your fruits. The Bible said, "By your fruits ye shall, by their fruits ye shall know them." That's what Jesus said and told his disciples in Matthew's chapter seven and those he preached to at the Sermon on the Mount. He said, that "It is the fruit that bears record and bears evidence that you are His children when you're walking after the fruits that God has." given to us when we become born again children of God and we understand that the truth is no lie so we can't be living and walking in darkness and claiming to be in the light something is wrong with that there are some who have come to the light didn't get what they thought they should have got and they walk right away from the light and walk right into darkness went right back like the dog returning to his own vomit in the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire and they go right back into sin and they will receive a worse judgment and punishment than when they were first sinners before they came to the light because now they know the truth and they're not walking in the truth that makes them free so they end up entangled with the same yoke of bondage that they were freed from you understand and it becomes even worse because the Bible says that when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none he said I shall return into the home from which I came and when he comes he findeth it empty swept and garnished meaning God has vacated the premises God cleaned the house but the person didn't want to walk in God so God vacated the premises and then the devil comes back and he taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they come in and they enter and dwell there and the Bible says that the last state of that man is worse than the first. So you got to understand that this walk is a very serious walk. You got to be serious with the God you claim to love and claim to serve. So we're going to conclude. Now we preached last night from 3 John and we talked about the fact that 
John wrote to the beloved Gaius, whom he loved in the truth. See, you're not loving anybody if you're not loving in the truth. And as my brother said last night, that you don't even have love unless you have God, for God is love. So there's no such thing as love mm -hmm. without God. You understand? And if you love God, then you also love the truth, because God is a God of truth. You can't walk in darkness. You can't be partaking and receiving false doctrine and walking according to that false doctrine and think you're walking in the love of God. You understand? Because that you're not walking in the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, Jesus said in John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. Now with all of that, we're going to get into the third part of this little series entitled True Love Today. And we're going to continue to walk in truth. And we're going to find out why God set certain giftings, certain types of, of, of leaders, and prepared them for certain groups of people to walk in truth, that we may all come to the edifying you know, and to the unity of the faith and being edified by the truth and love. We're going to discover that in Ephesians chapter 4. I've preached on this before. When we come back to this, which we have today, I believe God is going to give us a very powerful revelation once again in this chapter. Because the last time I came from this chapter, I was talking about the church being a body and not a business. That was earlier this year. And now we're coming back to Ephesians chapter 4 to clarify the fact that God has set certain giftings. But there are people who are going around mimicking, claiming to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. When in fact, they are not. But God still has a remnant of people here who love him, who will teach and preach the truth of the gospel. So we're going to learn the difference between those who are truly called and those who were not called. They were not sent. As I've heard it said before, they just went. You understand? So we're going to get into Ephesians chapter number four without further ado. It says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. We're supposed to be walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. You understand? And that vocation is given to us by God. Those thoughts, desires, the giftings and abilities are given by God here. With all lowliness and meekness with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So where true love is, is being able to forbear one another. Yeah, sometimes we get on each other's nerves a little bit, you know? But we got to forbear one another in love. That doesn't mean you allow people to take advantage of you. But what it means is even if we're in the concept of trying to show somebody the light, we still have to have the love of God in us to be able to properly communicate the truth of the word of God. Now, if they reject it, then that's on the person. But if you communicate it, you must do it in love. Endeavoring, verse 3, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And we know that today, because of the pride and because of envy and jealousy, there's not a whole lot of peace in the body of Christ today. There's not a whole lot of peace because there's a whole bunch of strife going on because there are certain people who don't want to change. As we talked about last night, there are people in the church like Diotrephes, as John called out, and third John, that love of to have the preeminence, meaning he wants to be superior over the other people in the church. So he was kicking people out of the church that was telling the truth because the truth exposed him for being a false teacher. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. 
So sometimes the truth will expose a pastor or a bishop or an apostle and they're not going to accept that. They're not going to tolerate that because you are bad for their business. You understand what I'm saying? And we already said the church is a body, not a business. So anybody running a church business is not called of God to do that. They are doing something that is contrary to what the word of God says. The word of God says we're to keep the unity of the spirit. And the body of Christ has nothing to do with this building or any other building. It has to do with the people who are born again, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and have repented of their sins. We are all the body of Christ and we all should be praying for one another. Amen. Amen. But those who are teaching false doctrines and things, they want the preeminence. They want to be the ones that everybody looks at and says they're all that. And so their names turn up on the big marquees. Come and see this big time bishop. Come and see this big time prophet. Come and see this big time evangelist or apostle or teacher. And they come up with and abuse the fivefold ministry, as they say, and it has been totally corrupted and abused because you got folks that don't even understand what the Bible's talking about. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling. One body of Christ, one Holy Spirit guiding the body of Christ, speaking and communicating the will of the Father and the Son. This is what it is talking about. Because people try to use these scriptures to deny the Godhead or the Trinity. And they are just as wrong as they can be. Because this is not denying the Trinity. This is letting you know that God is a Trinity. Because the three or triunity are one. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right now the Holy Ghost is, op is functioning the ministry of Christ to the believers and he only does so as he has received from the father and from the son and he glorifies God the father and Jesus Christ the son one Lord that's Jesus one faith that's the Christian faith one baptism that's the spiritual baptism work of the Holy Ghost when you become a born again believer this is not dealing with water baptism as some denominations want to teach. This is dealing with the baptismal work of the Holy Ghost washing and cleansing you according to the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. God is coming with his spirit to wash us with the washing of water by the word. Amen. It is the word of God that does the operation, that work of salvation in us by the Holy Ghost and by the truth of the gospel verse 6 one God that's Jehovah God right there and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all so all of this it speaks of the spirit it speaks of the father and it's going to speak of the son as well as we're going to see as we continue to read this chapter, the Godhead is all over the place in this chapter. And yet people can allow themselves to be hoodwinked and allow somebody to come and twist these scriptures and make you think that there's no such thing as a, as a triune God. Well, they can think what they want. The Bible still clarifies it. And those that rightly divide the word of truth understand that God is showing us the fullness of himself in, these cha in this chapter. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Meaning we didn't earn this thing. And it is Jesus Christ that measures the grace that is given to us. You understand by grace are we saved. Through faith. Now here's a little trick that some people do. They say we're saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. They're adding the word alone. And the word alone does not belong there. It is not in the scripture. So people go and, and, and people flock to that and they get caught up in Calvinism, which is a false doctrine. It is not the true gospel. And all they did was take the word alone 
and added next to grace, next to faith, and next to Christ. James already told us, can faith alone save us? No, it can't. Said faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. So you can't have one without the other. You understand? But all they did was take the word alone and add it, and you thinking, oh, it sounds catchy. No, we're saved by grace, which is a gift through God, through faith, which is a fruit of the Holy Ghost. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Some Bibles twist you up and put faithfulness there. No, I said faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness is a byproduct of the fruit of the Spirit. If I have faith, then I'll remain faithful. But they trick you there. By putting faithfulness there instead of faith. That's why you need a King James Bible. That's why you need the Bible that has the word of God intact. The way it should be. Because all people have to do is add a little here and a little there. And they'll have you all twisted up. And it's something you should never have been in and God never intended you to be in. Verse 8. Wherefore he saith. When he ascended up on high, that's Jesus, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Jesus Christ did that. Verse 9. Before I get to verse 9, it says Jesus Christ gave gifts to men. It didn't say we gave, men gave gifts to men as people are celebrating because we're now in the time that America is calling the Christmas season. And people are giving all kinds of things away, including things people don't like that they take back the day after December the 25th. You understand? That's why we celebrated the birth of Christ, not no Christ mass. But the world is into their stuff right now, and everybody's talking about getting this for Christmas and that for Christmas. And we already know Christmas has nothing to do with the Christ of the Bible. So we just ignore that and save our money and we're able to pay our bills, help people, and just have fun. And maybe enjoy ourselves a little bit. Perhaps. Verse 9, open parentheses. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He went into the place called paradise which at first was located under the earth just like hell is located under the earth and there was a great gulf fixed between the two we know in the account of Lazarus and the rich man that when the rich man looked his lifted up his eyes in hell he looked across and saw Abraham or uh, he looked across and saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham which is a place called Abraham's bosom. It was not that Abraham was holding and cuddling Lazarus like you cuddle a baby. This was an actual place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And there was a great gulf fix. So people on this side couldn't travel to that side and people on that side couldn't travel to this side. But Jesus went in there and announced that he had in fact fulfilled the requirements of the father and that he was able to take the saints that were in paradise out of paradise and so paradise is no longer located in the underworld paradise is now located somewhere in the in the third heaven where god has placed all believers until they receive the judgment seat of Christ until we all come together at the rapture when the dead in Christ shall rise and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and I am comforting you with these words because the Bible says therefore comfort one another with these words but Jesus went in there and Jesus cleaned out paradise and everybody on the wicked side where the rich man was saw that light and saw Jesus Christ in victory declaring victory the Bible says he even preached to the spirits in prison all the angels that were chained up he what did he preach he preached their doom 
because Jesus let him know that he was the one that liveth and is dead. Amen. And had the keys of hell and of death. Jesus defeated every devil and every imp that follows Satan and all of the wicked saw it. That's why at the end of the at, at, that's why at the end at the great white throne when at the name of Jesus, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You understand? Jesus has won the victory. Amen. Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, here we go. And he, meeting Jesus, gave some, comma, apostles. And the way the church has been reading this is that they, they've been saying, and he gave some apostles, comma. Well, the comma is not after apostles. The comma is after some. Jesus gave to some apostles. Semicolon. Starts another thought. And some comma prophets. Semicolon. And some comma evangelists. Semicolon. And some comma pastors and teachers. And that is the end of the verse. So Jesus Christ is the one that gave some apostles. It was Jesus Christ that named every apostle there was. And when Judas fell, he allowed the church to choose another apostle that had been there with him. And according to Acts chapter 1, he had to have been there with him from the time of his baptism to the time of his death. And they chose Matthias. Now we don't know what happened to Matthias. We don't have any other recordings of the acts of Matthias all we know is that Matthias was selected but by the time we get to Acts 9 we find that a guy named Saul was blinded on the road to Damascus he saw a light brighter than the sun and he fell off his beast and he was crying out he said who art thou Lord Jesus had said, Saul, Saul, why crucifiest thou me? Paul said, who are you, Lord? So he was so scared, wherever it was he saw in that light, he said, that's got to be the Lord. Because this man was trembling, I can imagine, beyond imagination. And Jesus said, I am Jesus Christ whom thou crucifiest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And you can't kick against the sharp prick. You're going, you're going to regret it. You understand? It was Jesus Christ that uh, chose Paul and appeared to Paul because Paul wasn't there walking with Jesus. Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. The people that Jesus had his battles and encounters with. The fake folks, the religious folks that was taking people out of the kingdom and forbidding people to come into the kingdom because of their false doctrines and teachings and false lifestyle. But it says Jesus gave some apostles when it says he. Jesus gave some prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament and some in the New Testament for and some in the New Testament for specific people and some evangelists, evangelists like Philip, who was also an apostle that went and preached to the Ethiopian being eunuch in the book of Acts. And he preached Jesus. The eunuch said, what does this mean? And he went to a place in the old scroll from Isaiah when it talked about Jesus was a sheep being led to the slaughter and like a lamb before his shears is dumb so he opened not his mouth this is Jesus Christ a picture of Jesus going to Calvary and dying on the cross this is what this was a picture of Philip expounded the truth to the eunuch and the eunuch received Jesus Christ and the eunuch said here's water what doth hinder me to be baptized Philip said, Thou mayest do it if thou believe with all thine heart. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You understand? 
and Philip permitted him to be baptized after he had made a confession of faith. You understand? It wasn't the act that saved him. It was the confession of his faith in Christ. God began the spiritual operation of salvation into the heart of the eunuch. But God sent an evangelist to preach to him. And not evangelists to just sit in a church and patronize themselves and get good offerings. You understand? Evangelists are supposed to be going out seeking and saving the lost as God gives them the ability and some pastors and teachers which are needed in the church we need godly leaders back in the church the bible says that a bishop must be blameless and that same standard goes for a pastor or anybody in the church that's trying to lead people or oversee people you have to be blameless you have to be living a lifestyle that brings about a good report you understand doesn't mean you didn't sin prior to coming. Paul was murdering and having Christians killed, giving his consent. But when he got converted, everything switched over. Now Paul was being persecuted the way he persecuted other Christians when he, he didn't know the truth. You understand? As a Christian, you could be persecuted in this place and in this life. But God said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. In this world, you should have tribulation, but Jesus overcame it. We need pastors. We need teachers. God has given me the gift to teach, and I want to teach my family, and I want to teach those that are willing to listen the truth of the word of God, how to rightly divide the word of truth, how to discern between what's right and wrong, how to be able to expose these false teachers and false apostles that are trying to hide under Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, but they say God is the one that calls apostles. You're not a pastor today, a bishop next week, and an apostle next year. You understand what I'm saying? God called them and ordained them from day one. He chose the apostles. From day one, he called them to be prophets. God told Jeremiah, before thou was formed in the womb, I knew thee. And he had sanctified him. Before his mom even got pregnant. You understand what I'm saying? That is an awesome, powerful God. Verse 12, now we're going to find out. What God said, his apostles, his prophets, his evangelists, his pastors, and his teachers. And Paul, according to the scripture, is the apostle to the Gentiles. So how did somebody else get that title when Paul already laid the foundation of Christ? And nobody can say anything contrary to what has been revealed to us through scripture. Amen. Anybody going against the scripture is going against the truth of God. And they are going to answer and give an account on judgment day. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. That's what the apostolic writings and the epistles are here for. For the work of the ministry. That's the pastors and teachers. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The Bible says, he that speak in tongues edifieth himself, but he that prophesy edifieth the church. That's what prophets are there for. Not to tell you you're going to get a fortune next year if you give a thousand dollars to the church and sow a seed. These are false prophets. These are false people in the church making merchandise of God's people and turning his body into a den of thieves. They will pay dearly on the day of judgment. And they will pay as they are exposed by people who know the truth. Expose these false prophets for who they are. They may get angry. They may even try to come after you. But guess what? God has the ability to protect you. Don't be afraid of these false prophets that are manipulating people out of their money. The Bible tells us what people were called for and God himself, his son, sent these people into this church according to the will of the Father because Jesus only did what he saw his Father do. And Jesus Christ is the son 
is divine and is God along with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God, that's Jesus. And the Word was God, that's Jesus. You understand the Trinity is all in these scriptures. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. People trying to trick you, coming up with crafty schemes to manipulate you, putting a Mac machine in their lobby, putting these subliminal thoughts in your mind, letting you know they're all about the money. They're not about your soul. They're about your money. Mm -hmm. They'll take your credit cards and rip you off. They'll do all kinds of things to you. Taking money from the poor. Don't you know in the Old Testament, one of the ties that was taken was a tie for the poor. And it was produce. It wasn't money. Mm, mm, mm. These people are deceiving people in the New Testament. You better be careful. The Bible warned us of these false prophets and teachers. Get yourself somebody that's teaching the truth and willing to minister the truth and you will not be carried to and fro. You will not be carried by everyone of doctrine. You understand? By deceitful, crafty men. The Bible says in Job chapter 5, it says that God taketh the wise in their own craftiness. You know that? God's got us. They won't be slick. God's got their oil slick for them. God is going to fix them. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, there we go, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom, verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's telling you that the increase of the body comes when everybody in the body of Christ is working on the same accord. When every believer is standing up for righteousness, standing against the wickedness of this world, then you're going to see the increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love, not in arguments, not in people tearing people down, but in love. And the only way we can walk in love is to speak the truth in love. And the truth is we can't be walking side by side with people who are teaching false doctrine and people receiving false doctrine and saying those are our brothers and sisters. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be unto you a God. And they, the, uh, he said, I will be unto them their God, and they will be unto me my people. So God is saying, get out of that mess. Yes, you can talk to them. Yes, you can pray for them. Yes, you can you can contend for the faith and show them the error of their ways. And if they repent and they change the way they're doing things, mm -hmm. then you may be able to fit there. But the problem is there are so many people that have the preeminence. They don't want to change because it's making lots and lots of money for them. But the Bible said what profit... What doth it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I'm not exchanging my soul for nobody's false doctrine or nobody's corrupted church. You understand? <laughs> 
This is a place where I want the truth of the gospel to be communicated. And if my family's here, or we have a group of people here like last night, we had quite a few in our living room hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank God for bigger crowds, smaller crowds. It doesn't matter. What matters is the truth of the gospel is going forth. And this concludes our part, three-part series on true love, speaking the truth in love. See, we can only love each other when we have God, and God is the author of truth, not the author of confusion. And if we trust in God, he will tell us everything we need to know. We're not omniscient. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, there'd be no need for anybody to know in part or prophesy in part because we will all know even as we are known, are known. Until now, the Holy, you know, until then, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. You understand? So when you embrace the truth, you are made free. When you embrace the truth, you have peace. And when you embrace the truth, you do not have to ever be ashamed of sharing the truth of the gospel. And don't let anybody shame you for this precious gospel. But if they do, rejoice. Because the Bible says that the disciples were glad to suffer shame for Jesus' name. So don't worry, no matter where you, what you go through, God has got all your bases covered. So just trust in God and learn to love and be at peace. And the God of peace and love shall be with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for allowing me to share such a powerful message. And I pray that your spirit will help those that hear to be able to glean from the truth that was shared. And that we may be able to help others come out of the darkness and into the light so that they will be in the know and know what's going on out here. And know how to live in these times that we're in as we await the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with anticipation and with joy. Give us mercies, watch over us and protect us from all harm and danger and help us to be true Christians and true disciples and believers in Christ sharing the truth and living according to the truth that we may abide in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.